Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Enbridge Savings by Design webinar on the topic of deep energy retrofits. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have a, an agenda there. That, uh, we're going to just welcome everyone right now, and you can see the team is joining us all. Um, we're going to have an introduction by Mary Sai, and then we're going to show the, the video presentation on deep energy retrofits. Uh, and then we have a Q&A portion uh, at uh, 1.30 with our experts, Dave Peterson, Ryan Evans, and Bettina Hoar. And at 2 o'clock, um, SBC, the Sustainable Buildings Canada organization, has done some research um, or commissioned some research by Energy at Work on achieving a 50% energy reduction in existing uh, condominiums. So we have a short presentation on that, if you can stick around after this webinar. Um, and then uh, the Energy at Work team will join us uh, for some Q&A about that um, at 2 o'clock. So if you can stay a little bit longer, we'll be happy to have you. Um, if you have not used this uh, go-to webinar software before, you'll see there's a question section on the, the little um, application. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to type them in there, and we will try to answer them as quickly as possible uh, during the Q&A. And also, we will review this again at the Q&A, but if you have questions, what we're going to do is have you put up your hand. You'll see a little hand button there. Um, and we will open up your mic so you can ask the question directly of our experts. So uh, with that, let me hand it over to Mary Sai from Enbridge Gas to introduce the program. Thanks, Adam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session. As Adam said, my name is Mary Sai from Enbridge Gas, and I'm an energy advisor for commercial new construction, primarily savings by design program. For those who are not familiar with the Savings by Design program, it is an Enbridge program that is facilitated by Sustainable Buildings Canada that supports builders, developers to achieve 15% combined energy efficiency above current code. Today's webinar is on deep energy retrofits, and in a number of situations, these projects can also participate in our program. Please reach out to me should you have any questions or you'd like to discuss further. First, I'd like to introduce you to our team at Sustainable Buildings Canada, who will be conducting today's webinar. Following the webinar today, a link will be sent out as to how to access the information that is presented. Also, we'd love to hear from you as well, as we will be doing a live Q&A after the webinar, so please hold any questions until then, or raise your hand as Adam indicated. The webinar today will also be circulated, so don't worry if you forget a few things you may have missed. There's another chance to review the content. Thanks again for joining today, and I'll hand it off to Sustainable Buildings Canada to begin. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, you can see uh, our entire team is here ready to uh, answer your questions, but we're gonna watch a, a short video, about a 20 minute video first, um, that has been pre-recorded by our team uh, to answer the common questions on deep energy retrofits. discuss conserving energy in existing buildings uh, through deep energy retrofits. Uh, this is going to be an overview presentation of uh, energy modeling and code related considerations for existing buildings investing into a deep energy retrofit. A deep energy retrofit consists of energy conservations that would be conducted in an existing building energy conservation measures and improvements uh, to buildings, we're not talking about one uh, measure at a time, we're talking about uh, a collection 
of measures that make up the 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 deep energy retrofit the the objective of conducting a deep energy retrofit uh, is to result in an overall improvement in the buildings and in performance i might default to say energy because that's where we focus on but it's it's not just energy we're also looking at indoor air quality we're looking at durability thermal comfort um, occupant comfort as well so these are all uh, very important factors to consider uh, and not just energy Building owners today will be quite familiar with conventional retrofits that typically focus on a single building system. So whether they're looking to improve uh, maybe a, the boilers supplying their, their, their heating or their chiller or their cooling tower, whether it be for maintenance reasons and they take the, take the opportunity to, to do better than the bare minimum, this is what's known as, as a conventional retrofit measure in existing buildings. Um, the energy savings are estimated, calculated on the performance improvement of the new piece of equipment that is uh, looking to be installed versus the existing equipment that is there. When we conduct these analyses and these calculations, um, the approach seldom looks at the building as a whole. The secondary effects and how one system impacts other systems are usually uh, overlooked and not considered. The objective is to uh, reduce the energy consumption by at least 50% uh, compared to a historical baseline. The approach for a deep energy retrofit would be a very similar approach to what new construction high performance buildings do uh, today. Solar heat gain, uh, as well as the potential for um, daylighting. So through glazing, we have a lot of uh, components that that um, an opaque wall doesn't provide us with. And um, looking at passive gains as a benefit from the standpoint of daylighting, which can help obviously to augment electrical light uh, loads, um, and the upsides and downsides of, of daylight um, from a design perspective. So when we're looking at glazing uh, or passive glazing technologies, we're looking generally today at um, low e coated products um, in most cases a, an inert gas fill to help with convective losses those um, those products have certainly evolved um, over the last um, three decades to be much more specific in terms of what they can do and how they're designed to be utilized in simple terms near infrared is the same as solar heat gain it's the potential for the sun's energy to actually enter through um, a window system um, in ideal situations, provide passive solar gains that can augment our heating systems. In um, worst case scenarios, this creates the challenge of overheating, especially in highly insulated and over uh, airtight buildings, which um, again, with larger window to wall ratios can be susceptible to overheating even in uh, climate zones five and six. Um, on the right side of the equation, um, Basically, the uh, far infrared is the same as the emissivity of the glazing. And in this case, all of the uh, types of uh, glazings that we'll be looking at are low uh, or have low emissivity, which generally means that they are directing radiant energy losses back into that space in lieu of letting them out through the glazing itself. So these are high performance glazing systems that um, work effectively both um, under uh, solar load as well as looking at nighttime uh, or mitigating nighttime losses. The fine tunability within the near infrared spectrum is looking again at um, the solar heat gain coefficients. And here we can actually look at bringing energy in. Up to 70% of that energy can come through the glazing and augment our natural gas that we use to heat. We have mid solar gain products that reject 60% of the solar heat gain, allowing 40% through, which is a very well balanced glazing system for our climate zone. And then low solar gain products rejecting up to 80% of that solar heat gain before it creates a challenge from a comfort perspective as well as um, a perspective where we now have to work with uh, an electric um, system to cool the space. From a solar heat gain perspective, generally speaking, in residential buildings or multi-unit residential buildings where we have higher window to wall ratios, we aren't necessarily looking for passive gains. And the challenge even within suites facing south that could harvest those passive gains is how do we share that gain throughout the building? And there are certain mechanical systems that allow us to do that. 
We can, of course, add components to the building to provide shading. Uh, this is a challenge architecturally sometimes, certainly from a first cost perspective and from a maintenance and durability perspective. But some buildings lend themselves rather well to adding um, both horizontal and vertical fins to manage uh, direct solar exposure. Um, solar South is, is one area where we could harvest potentially, and we could look at balconies or horizontal overhangs to mitigate the high angle of summer sun. The challenge, of course, is we have highly um, glazed west facades where that lower angle of sun comes in, it becomes very difficult to, to shade those. Um, hence, I think a better glazing specification, maybe a mid or low solar gain glazing in those areas can, um, can certainly pay dividends in terms of not just energy efficiency, but comfort as well. And with a sensor technology in our lighting systems actually reduce um, electrical um, energy requirements uh, during the daytime hours. We have to be careful in that um, if we don't balance this correctly, and if we bring in too much light, we also have the potential for glare in this case, um, which is obviously a, a huge issue for the occupants in that space. Um, it's not just getting light in at any cost, it's getting the right type of light in that's gonna be effective uh, that can help augment our electrical lighting. Um, and so we do have um, the tools available to us um, through many of the uh, uh, design and uh, modeling programs to actually um, work to create better daylight designs and to uh, be more efficient at harvesting these and balancing them with the electrical loads. And this is something that um, for multi-unit residential as well as um, commercial ICI buildings uh, makes a lot of sense and um, it certainly leads towards a, a more energy efficient building system. key difference between energy modeling of existing buildings from modeling for new buildings is that we have an existing building, we have data from that building. So we're able to make a calibrated model to give us a more accurate forecasting tool to see the impact of each individual measure compared to um, a new construction project where we have to compare our design against the building code and there's a lot more of assumptions that go in there. So the benefit of a deep energy retrofit energy modeling exercise is that we're actually getting a little bit more accurate results and projections from our model. We conduct these analyses for deep energy retrofits as a it's a, it's a whole building exercise um, but not just the upfront analysis it's also the construction process uh, needs to be done as a whole building. We can't just look at it under a microscope um, we need to see the picture as a whole. This is one of the areas specifically that is um, uh, is not necessarily connected to a specific product or detail. There's a combination of things, um, and there's no one product that we can apply or specify in these buildings uh, to provide air tightness. This is a holistic approach at reviewing key areas and details, and it starts with a couple of. Um, of, of sort of ideas and understandings. Um, the key is that we want a continuous air barrier. Um, and this is something we really have to look at at the time of uh, the base drawing set being prepared. Um, and we have to make sure that we can clearly state and, and um, show that air barrier on the drawings themselves. And this is something that the trades must be able to clearly and, and easily follow. Um, the next segment is really communicating how important air tightness is. And that discussion is something that because of multiple trades on the site and um, sequencing issues, we have a challenge sometimes controlling um, that detail through the trade. So having them on board early, providing uh, key details on drawings and very clear um, trades uh, scope of work uh, documents are helpful in terms of making sure everybody's on the same page. And there's consistency in terms of how the air barrier is, is um, is both detailed as well as reviewed from a quality control perspective. Um, there are some tools that can help us. There's certainly the integrated design process, bringing key trades in early into the program can be very helpful in terms of understanding or keeping that level of understanding consistent um, even before the project starts. And as much as we can front end load this process, uh, testing for compliance is also a, a key component to air tightness. Um, is specifically looking at blower door testing and understanding uh, again where we have potential for uh, infiltration and exfiltration um, air movement 
um, how can we test for this and how can that test actually form or be part of the process um, for the trades um, and for key uh, staff uh, through the contractor on site to understand this process better. Um, and so this is, I think, this this potential for continual improvement. Um, and it, we are seeing um, certain contractors out there that have an excellent track record um, because they've gone to these lengths to manage the process uh, consistently. Um, there are some takeaways here with an airtight building. And in terms of passive systems, um, it's the one area where we would see the greatest returns in terms of um, energy reduction. It also connects directly to the occupants of the space. And I think this is an important consideration because uh, uncontrolled ventilation creates all kinds of challenges in the indoor uh, environment, specifically to indoor environmental quality, um, in indoor air quality specifically. When you're doing a deep energy retrofit, one of the things you have to take into account is the condition of the building, what it was originally designed for. And very often when we have, you know, brick buildings, our traditional big brick buildings, they were designed for heating systems that had a lot of particulate matter. So a coal or a gas fired uh, heating system would bring hot air through the system, but it would also bring a lot of particulate and that particulate had to escape the building. So our buildings were built to be breathable so that that particulate matter could escape. What's happening now is we're doing deep energy retrofits, we're recognizing that we need to control air tightness. But when we do that, then the air quality, the indoor air quality becomes critical. And it's no longer because of the source of the heat that is causing a lot of particulates. There are different causes of poor indoor air quality. So they include biological causes. Uh, the most famous one, of course, is mold. We've all experienced buildings that have mold. Uh, chemical uh, causes of poor indoor air quality, which could be from the products that we're using to build and finish the actual building itself, plus the additional chemical load of the things that we use to clean the building with and perfumes that people wear in the building, etc. cetera. Uh, and then part, uh, particles and aerosols. Air particulates are one of the most difficult things to eliminate, and it really is a volume business. So what we have to recognize is that construction practice, material selection and external sources all need to be looked at in order to guarantee that we are providing good indoor air quality. This becomes a very messy subject when we're talking about um, existing buildings because some of the code pertains to renovations and the reparations of existing systems on the building and that's covered by part 11 of, of the code. Um, However, depending on the scope of the measure, uh, it might very quickly become a new system or a new design or an addition onto the building, and it is no longer a repair. This now triggers um, all, the, all the other parts of the building code that bring us up to today's current standards. Uh, so it's no longer doing better than what we already had, it's doing better than what the code prescribes today. And, and from an energy perspective, uh, that can pose a lot of challenges in terms of meeting some of these higher performance requirements. Um, so, the, so the key thing about the code is to, to understand and confirm what parts of the building code would apply to the project uh, as early on in the design of the project as possible. Despite being included in an existing building renovation part 11 the design and construction of the new building system needs to also comply with other parts of the code um, so the so again think of a mechanical system um, let's say fan coils if we're deciding to change a fan coil system to um, to a, a new heat pump system or, or to a um, variable refrigerant flow system um, this this now triggers or could trigger um, a, a new system design and construction, which then no longer falls under part 11, it falls under um, parts, uh, parts three or part nine, and then it also triggers part 12, which is the energy efficiency portion of the code. The answer to, to that question is, is, not, is not, uh, not very black and white. 
it uh, it really depends on on the the, the scope of the project. Um, does Part 12 apply? So from an energy perspective, Part 12 being the energy conservation portion of the code, does that apply to the project? Um, the city and the the city officials uh, where the project is located are the ones who are responsible for confirming that along with the project owner. If uh, a Part 12 does apply to the project, um, what building systems are included in the project? So the code is uh, has has two paths that you can follow. You can follow a prescriptive checklist path, or you can follow a performance path, which allows you to trade off um, certain uh, deficiencies of one building system with uh, higher efficiencies and benefits of another to get an overall um, improved performance. Um, however, with existing buildings, it becomes difficult because we're not necessarily comparing to code. So this is where it can become really tricky. If you're doing the whole thing, the whole package, and you're improving the envelope, and you're improving the mechanical systems, and you're improving uh, ventilation, and you're improving electrical systems, well then it's 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 really important to uh, to get in touch with the building officials uh, early on to kind of get an idea of what what parts of the code are going to be applicable to the project. you can raise your hand and then what we'll do is we'll let you know that we're going to turn your mic on and then you can go ahead and ask, ask your question. Uh, so right now we have our experts back, we have Christina Moore, Dave Peterson, and Ben Evans here ready to go. You guys can go ahead. Well, if no one else uh, has a question right now, um, I have a question. Um, so I, I guess we kind of answered it, but um, when we're dealing with a deep energy retrofit as opposed to a, a conventional retrofit, um, is there any one particular component um, that will be coming up uh, for a regular building that would um, lend itself to consideration of replacing a lot of elements in the building for example a, an hvac system or a window recladding type of thing oh it seems like a two-part question uh, <clears throat> um it, it i'll i'll take a stab at it and um because you mentioned windows i'm sure dave will have some comments as well um mechanical systems and electrical systems tend to have there's, there's the bigger overall system as we can understand if it's a fan coil you can understand the the water loops and the plant equipment serving the water the the loops and then the fan coils that are connected to it at the individual suite level if we're talking about a multi-res building or even an office uh space um there are, there are definitely a lot of components in there so from 
from a deep energy retrofit, again, we're talking about a holistic approach. Um, this here, a lot of the times we would focus on the plant equipment um, because those tend to have a, you know, a useful life period uh, and you're, you tend to be aligning your retrofit plans with the maintenance schedules and, and even the, the, uh, the end of life um, for the various equipment. And then it's at those times you can take the opportunity to to verify other building systems as well to see if it makes sense to to put a package together. Uh, hence, looking at that deep energy approach versus your traditional one-off retrofit measure. Um, looking mechanical systems and electrical systems tend to be the ones that get changed more frequently because they have a shorter lifespan compared to if you look at the envelope systems where it's the exterior walls and windows, their useful life tends to be more than, than a 20, 30 year, uh, or at least it's stretched out longer just because potential costs uh, concerns to those measures. So we see a lot of work that gets focused on the mechanical and electrical, and I have a feeling with the deep, deep retrofit approach, and Dave can, can comment to this, that we'll start seeing more envelope measures included in the scope of deep energy retrofits because that will actually set the tone for your mechanical systems. Uh, the envelope will drive the loads, and if you can improve the envelope, you can actually reduce the loads on your mechanical systems, which then gives you uh, uh, both uh, immediate and long-term savings, immediate from a capital expenditure perspective, where you can actually resize some equipment because now the loading on your on your building is actually less because of the envelope measures. And then operationally, with, uh, with reduced loads, you actually have reduced energy consumption. So from an operational perspective, you'll, you'll reduce costing uh, and maintenance uh, as well. Anything to add in there, Dave, about the envelope? Yeah, so I like your point, Ryan, that, that very often from a, a typical um, uh, sort of replacement scenario, we're looking at systems within the building, whereas with the deep energy retrofit, we really have to look at the building as a holistic, or as a holistic whole and entity and really balance those components. Um, and the enclosure is, is critically important. First of all, it's an expensive component to, to upgrade in terms of energy performance. But very often these buildings, as they're moving into their next life phase, um, with let's say a new owner or new tenants involved, um, are also getting facelifts, are also looking to modernize and change the, the, uh, the look of the building. And so this gives us an opportunity to look at the entire enclosure um, not just the window component or not just the facade cladding materials um, to determine, again, what we're looking for. And if that's a combination of, of lower maintenance, potentially better overall uh, energy um, consumption numbers that we can then right size our mechanical systems on, which I think is critically important to, to have this entire entity work sort of as it should, um, I think are important considerations. Um, Generally speaking, though, the challenge that we see is, is that, you know, most of these um, components are done in silos. And so we really don't understand the implications or the impacts of some of the other um, deep energy retrofit components unless we're really looking at the building as a whole. And I'll add as well that I think adding the energy modeling component to this really helps us compare and contrast the different components of that um, uh, system and to make sure that they're balanced and right size, that we're not going overboard with one area, let's say adding too much insulation or uh, pushing with triple glazed windows um, versus looking really at the, at the building hole and understanding what we're trying to achieve with this. And I'm just gonna jump in and say, let's not forget the equation, the third part of that equation, which is the humans in the building. So when we do have a chance to do a major retrofit, uh, you're going to be competing against buildings in the future that are now beginning to look at things like uh, Fitwell and well certification. They're beginning to look much more at the human impact, at comfort, at well-being. All of these things are now on the horizon. So it's just something to keep in mind as you're as you're thinking about a major retrofit. Think about what's happening in the future as well and the buildings you'll be competing with. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I could hardly hear you, Amy. Um, that's why I was uh, I was not responding earlier. Apparently, you were telling me to go ahead. Um, okay, just in terms of uh, you know this presentation and uh, a question just came to my mind in terms of the COVID nineteen pandemic situation, right? 
um, outside of consideration of the building code, um, are there other considerations now that are you know being um, looked at in terms of say for example, ASHRAE is recommending uh, three year change per hour. Um, you know uh, the use of probably MERV MERV 13 filters instead of uh, MERV 8 or MERV 10, and uh, how those impact on the actual uh, consumption in terms of energy of the building. Um, also in terms of uh, considerations uh, with respect to the actual energy use. Um, where buildings were not necessarily designed, say, for example, to use um, MERV 13 filters. And, uh, you know, you have single pane windows and the recommendation probably from ASHRAE is to have 40 to 60 percent uh, relative humidity in the winter. Um, this might not be possible with a single pane window um, building, you know, in the envelope you might have condensation taking place and so on. So uh, are these being uh, considered in terms of, you know, deep retrofits, how those impact on the whole um, energy uh, usage and, and tenant comfort and so on? That's a great question. Um, we know that there is work that's being done. Um, the, you know, we, we only have a little bit of data, like the, the pandemic really at the peak in terms of lockdown started in, in like the middle of March. So I know there's a lot of work that's being done um, currently. The big thing is looking at normalization um, for with regards to energy. We're looking at new norms with the pandemic, the lockdowns, and it's pretty much zero occupancy in these buildings and how that has an effect on them. So there's one, but in terms of the the impact of the you know, is it some ASHRAE studies and whatnot, I I would expect to see you know some more information um, in in the weeks and months to come because I know it's being worked on. I haven't seen anything come across my desk just yet, but if you know, we only have a few months worth of data, so I th still think there's still some studies being conducted. Um, that's what I'm aware of. Uh, Bettina and Dave, I'll let them if they've heard of anything else. But definitely from an energy perspective, uh, new norms are being looked at so that in the event of future lockdowns, we'll, we'll have some comparisons because to your point, um, we want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples and it's, it's it doesn't make a lot of sense to be penalizing existing buildings up to these standards that that could be impossible for them to achieve again you gave an example about um you know single pane windows and and that pretty much reducing the overall performance of the envelope and not being able to uh achieve certain indoor climate conditions as a result of that so definitely there's there's that has to be taken into account because to date ashray has already factored in you know, codes for existing buildings versus codes for new construction. And, uh, you know, we're trying to move the existing buildings towards this in the, in the same direction as we're going in new construction, but it's definitely not being held to the same standards. That's for sure. Yeah, let me just, um, and, and it was, it's an excellent question. Thanks for asking that because it really sort of covers and connects to all of the facade components and the mechanical systems that we're looking at sort of from a holistic perspective in these, um, deep energy retrofit. So the challenge in, in terms of fenestration already is, is not even just looking at single pane windows that we may see in existing buildings, even code compliant SB10 windows, um, you know, when we're looking at RH above 50% in typical uh, winter conditions, you will see liquid water uh, formation or condensation formation on those products and they are much higher performing, but still the weakest link uh, in the enclosure. So there are some best practices outside of COVID in terms of low energy buildings that if we were able to combine those, and a lot of it has to do with refocusing um, uh, sort of energy on the facade itself and looking at enhancing, um, you know, the thermal uh, continuity and, and the detailing there so that we can work with downsized or right-sized mechanical systems, but also then it allows us to change our set points. And so we can have enhanced RH, which doesn't just make us um, less susceptible to certain viruses and, and uh, infections, it also makes us more comfortable as humans in that space. Um, and so I think that there's a balance there that doesn't just have to be something we do for COVID or for, for the next pandemic, but also just I think it makes sense for us to then look at the occupants in that space and how it impacts them. And also looking at temperature set points. This is the other thing. If we can increase RH without condensation formation on the weak link of a building system, we can maybe change our temperature set points and save energy in the process as well. So I think there's a, a lot of spin-off connection there um, that as much as we're now focused on the pandemic side of things, it really just takes us back into best practices and, and things that we should be doing in these buildings anyway. 
Yep. And the only thing I'd add is, you know, we talk about 40 to 60 relative humidity, but we want to be aware that anything over 50 RH, we start to incur dangerous areas for mold. But to have that kind of precision on an old building, oh, we're only between 40 and 50% RH is only possible when you have a very airtight situation. So, so airtightness over and over and over, you'll be hearing us say, it is the, the best and perhaps only solution for us making dramatic changes to these buildings and then balancing that with all the other elements. But, it, but that's a QA element. It's knowledge about how to have that good air tightness and what, what is possible within each and every building. And so the more you can control, obviously, then the better the quality of, of the indoor environment and energy savings, et cetera. But there's always gonna be that fine balance. Okay, we have another question um, in the in the chat here. Um, what determines a deep energy retrofit? What performance measure are we working to? And so I'll expand on that slightly and ask if there are any um, independent building standards, perhaps that can help guide a deep energy retrofit. Sorry about that. I had a phone. Um, I had a phone ring. I thought I'd silenced everything, but sure enough, I didn't. Um, sorry. Um, what makes a deep energy retrofit was pretty much the question. I can't see the questions being asked. So, uh, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong. If that wasn't the question. That is. Yeah, I can read it again. What determines a deep energy retrofit? Uh, what performance measure are we working to? And so uh, adding on to that, are there any um, independent building standards that could help uh, guide a deep energy retrofit? Right. So that's where there doesn't seem to be a unanimous um, definition of what makes up a deep energy retrofit. So that that's something that we're trying to rein in. And in, in the presentation, the definition that we provided is something to achieve a 50% reduction in, in overall energy performance. Um, and, and and that can also touch down. We can start applying that to carbon as well. So carbon and energy, because um, those are metrics that we can track and measure. Uh, you know, wellness. Bettina will be able to speak to that because uh, I'm just I'm not well versed in it. But there's definitely metrics now that we can track for in indoor environment. And I'll let Bettina speak after that. So what makes deep energy retrofit? It's it's not one measure. It is a combination of measures looking to improve the whole performance of the building from the envelope inward, um, which includes uh, anything in the enclosure, so envelope related, anything in the mechanical systems, anything in the electrical systems, anything in terms of like occupant use, which is a big factor, and in terms of the wellness uh, of the occupants and environmental conditions. So that all of those, like you're, it's not just one measure, it can be, it's a combination of measures to achieve uh, an overall objective and the target that we're recommending which seems to be becoming more and more of an accepted definition is achieving a 50 percent uh, improvement over baseline conditions and baseline would mean your existing conditions and for the well-being of the people inside the building again there are no standard measures that are acceptable and again it is a holistic measure i recommend you look at the well and the fit well checklist not necessarily to say that you should get yourself certified to those standards, but they are quantifiable, very easy to read and understand measures that you can, um, that will help you to evaluate your building existing and how uh, the um, recommendations that you're looking at implementing might lead towards points in either one of those systems and um, add up to a certain uh, certification level if that's something that would interest you, but more more than anything, is using those as a as a good background check to see what's what's possible. Um, I'll reach out and just mention that there are a couple of third party standards and systems, or at least um, research studies that have been done to help quantify deep energy retrofits, both in Part Nine and sort of the Part Eleven building side of the equation. Um, George Brown did a um, a project several years ago. Now I'm, I want to say seven or eight years ago looking at deep energy retrofit of, of sort of more typical um, solid masonry housing stock in Toronto, a program they called Argyle. 
where um, they did uh, deep energy retrofits using um, a very specific system for these sort of 1950s, 1940s sort of wartime style houses. Um, and a lot of it was again, focused not just on the performance and, and the um, enhancements to the building, uh, but also there was a connection there to the trades um, and how to train um, renovators to do this work. So uh, a fairly groundbreaking study um, that included censoring of the walls and looking at sort of hydrothermal studies and air tightness benefits. Um, and so that's one that you can find, I believe, on um, George Brown's website. Um, CMHC did something similar in part nine buildings as well uh, several years ago um, and, and through a series of case studies. Um, had sort of different approaches at deep energy retrofits in existing um, residential dwellings. Um, in terms of part 11 or sort of the part three side of the equation, the only one I can really reference, but one that I think is taking on uh, a bit of popularity now is the Interfit standard. And Interfit is um, the sort of existing building connection to Passive House. Um, and I um, was lucky enough to be part of a team that looked at a project in Hamilton in the North End a few years ago. And that building is actually a building that um, I live about a block away from uh, at this point. And it's the largest uh, uh, building in Canada today that's undergoing this interfit, uh, deep energy retrofit standard uh, at 12 stories. And so there's some really interesting um, information out there, some very current projects, as well as ones that if we look a few years back, we'll be able to unearth some information um, and standards in the US as well, but I'm just focused on those Canadian ones. So uh, they may be worthwhile to look into. Thank you. Um, okay, here's another question sort of for everyone. Um, in comparison to existing building owners, how often do you work with building developers to design more sustainable buildings? What does that involvement look like? And do you work with geothermal technologies? Who wants to feel that? Is Dave, why don't you start? You're probably the closest at hand. Um, so, you know, from a program perspective, um, through Savings by Design, we tend to work with a lot of developers and sort of the um, the new builds side of the equation. And as Mary mentioned, though, we have brought through uh, this program um, some existing buildings. And uh, I think this is always where it's exciting because we have owners and then generally speaking, existing tenants. Um, in these buildings. And so they are not a sort of empty shells that we're building from the ground up. These are um, very often occupied buildings and they have their own series of, of challenges um, connected to them. Um, I do a lot of work personally through my practice um, with existing buildings, part 11 buildings, and generally speaking, older buildings or heritage building stock that are going through, in many cases, a second and third sort of renewal or revival in terms of that building. And uh, very often we are looking at then owners and operators um, that basically uh, understand the cachet of their buildings, generally speaking, great locations, beautiful building stock in terms of the aesthetic, um, but certainly challenges in terms of, of um, you know, uh, lease rates and, and the energy use of these older buildings. And so it's always a balance that I find um, interesting that it's between the aesthetic and sort of maintaining that look, um, because that's something that, that in, in terms of, especially the office segment uh, is very important. Um, and then balancing that with having the infrastructure in place to be able to work with modern business um, and also to have a comfortable uh, sort of collaborative space. Um, so um, certainly those components are, are also a part of, of what we work with as a team. Um, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but certainly it, it's a, a broad brush um, response. Um, I don't know how many of you out there are aware of the Energy Sprung program. I'm not an expert, but it is something that is a fascinating program that is being brought in through uh, saving Sustainable Buildings Canada. Um, there's a lot of information out there about it. Maybe if we could just put the website, Adam, so that people are aware of it. it is It is a very interesting program for deep energy retrofit sort of in a day, quote unquote. Um, the other question you asked about was geothermal and there definitely I, in, in my business, 
We've seen it in the Savings by Design program, absolutely. We've seen people considering it and looking at it, uh, especially now that there are these third party uh, where somebody else essentially pays for the infrastructure and you, the, the building rents it back uh, and then buys it back at the end of a term for a dollar kind of thing. But maybe Ryan, you could speak much more to that. Yes, uh, I'm. I'm going to be. I'm going to be open here. There's questions that are coming in that are being asked by Adam, and there's a question here. So I just want to clarify the question: Is it? Uh, are we talking about the question from Ottawa uh, about the geo exchange, or was this? Is this a different question? I just want to make sure I'm. I'm answering the right question. Um, the, the, you know what? There is a lot of overlap in the questions. So how about I? I, I will pose that one too, and you can kind of combine your answers. Uh, so this is uh, from Brett. Uh, hello from Ottawa. Do you have any experience recladding and reglazing buildings in a way that balances the heating and cooling load? Um, I'm thinking in the context of geo exchange fields, which can be used for seasonal energy storage, but need balanced thermal loads for long-term temperature stability. Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. That's a good question for Dave in terms of like recladding and balancing to get the load. Definitely the understanding of the geo exchange of of establishing a balanced load. Um, appears to be well understood by Brett, so it's really the question appears to be a, a recladding and reglazing question. So let, let me um, just add my two cents to that one, and I think it's a really important consideration because it does look at all of the components of the building, not just the mechanical ones. Um, and I think maybe I'll answer the other question as well with this. So I have worked on um, some existing building projects, deep energy retrofits, where geo exchange has been contemplated. It's a challenge, certainly in densified areas, because you have to figure out where to put your borehole field. Um, and this is something you can't usually put underneath the building at that point, because you're usually not doing any work there unless you're, you know, creating an underground parking uh, lot. Um, and so that creates one of the challenges, I think, with these building systems. Um, the other component is to really understand, I think, the importance of the enclosure when it comes to designing a balanced um, field. And the potential as well, and again, a lot of this conversation can't be done just focused on the enclosure, it has to be done with our mechanical design professionals present, is that if we're looking at components like solar heat gain and we're looking at passive heating, um, are there ways of taking that heat energy, um, using it when it makes sense to, but also then potentially using that to rebalance or to help balance the field um, by being, being able to take that energy and actually dump it into the ground? Um, let's say when we have an excess of that uh, during the summer months. And so can we use that approach um, from a very passive design perspective? And I think the answer would be yes. Um, we certainly have the solar exposure in Southern Ontario. Um, and I do think we have the design professionals and we have the ability to, to really look at these things holistically and, and um, understand what the impacts would be. Um, I don't think it's a simple um, thing to look at. It certainly um, is getting more and more uh, traction based on low carbon. Um, and that Part of that discussion is what well. we've talked about low energy buildings resilience all of these key components but the carbon footprint and the reduction in carbon footprint in existing buildings i think is something that we're going to spend more time on uh, in the future and geo exchange certainly is i think the potential or district energy systems um you know that can help us sort of uh, have our cake and eat it too okay we have a, a question for Mary, uh, Mary Sai from Enbridge. Um, is Enbridge talking with governments about creating a pan-Canadian retrofit program for a post-COVID-19 economic recovery? Well, just to let you know, um, currently, right now, um, Enbridge, as you know, purchased Union Gas last year. So uh, moving forward, it's going to be all one company, Enbridge Gas. So right now, um, we're working on what we refer to as our next gen um, rollout. So um, that will be happening in 2022. So right now, um, we're looking in all different considerations, both a retrofit and a new construction market on um, possible programs. So um, honestly, if you have any great ideas, please share them with me. I'd be more than happy to bring them up. But right now, um, we're still working with our current framework until the end of uh, 2021. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, okay, we have a, a few more questions here. Um, 
So one of them, this is definitely for Ryan. Uh, what energy modeling software are you seeing uh, being used for deep energy retrofits? Um, that's a good question. Uh, definitely, it's it's more the more advanced energy modeling software. Um, the simple software that we used 10, 10 15 years ago just uh, don't have the the capability of modeling some of the the, the complexities. Uh, of the various measures that are being uh, considered today uh, to achieve these these higher uh, performance targets in both energy and carbon. Um, so we're seeing um, a, a big uptick in in Energy Plus um, and that uh, and the various interfaces and the user interfaces that are being used to uh, to support that uh, that modeling engine. So Energy Plus is a big one. Uh, IES Virtual Environment is another big one. Uh, the what differentiates these two software um, versus uh, eQuest, which has been an industry uh, a, a, an industry favorite uh, for the last uh, you know 10 15 years easily, is um, is the improved analysis on the envelope components. Um, Energy Plus and, and IES Virtual Environment do do a much better job at at analyzing the detailed granular thermal loads of all the various envelope components uh, which then helps establish um, a better uh, base load for for which we're going to build our mechanical systems on so that's those are those are pretty much the, the three big ones that we're seeing used the most still um, eQuest given the fact that it's free uh, energy plus is free but it's more complicated so you might have to pay for a user uh, interface to, to, to make the modeling a little bit more simple um, and IES is a is a is a private software um, so the barrier of entry with that software are the the licensing fees associated with it so those are the three that we use the most there are some other ones but they're um, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't necessarily mention them to answer this question okay uh, fair enough. Thank you. Um, so another question, uh, that's sort of uh, a little more broad: um, Can a retrofit achieve better than code performance? That's a great, great question, uh, and I'll take that one as well. Just uh, so the simple answer is yes. Um, a a retrofit can achieve better than code. Um, a lot of the performance targets. For, for example, the savings by design performance target, the minimum eligibility requires 15% better than code. Um, and that is that is very achievable in many of the mechanical and electrical measures that, that you can perform. And then with envelope measures, uh, we've worked on a, on a pretty much deep energy retrofit workshop um, dating back in April. And we were, we were able to demonstrate how we can achieve passive house like performance through the envelope measures and the mechanical systems. Um, and that was done on an eight-story, 32-unit uh, existing apartment building built in uh, the 1970s. So yes, uh, we can we can exceed, we can meet and and surpass code by a big margin uh, with deep energy retrofits. Yep, there's the damn fourth case as well. Uh, Single-family home, passive house standard from a little bungalow. It, it's amazing what can be done. And I might add, using integrated design, and I think that's critical, is you can't have a deep energy retrofit without having all of the parties at the table early and often. Absolutely, Dave, Dave mentioned um, conducting calculations for various measures in, in silos, but that tends to happen with the actual consulting teams as well, where uh, the various disciplines and the, and the co-consultants on the team kind of operate in silos and everybody just puts together their own pieces of work. Uh, it's really the integrative design approach, as Bettina mentioned, that ties it all together. And it's having, uh, and energy modelers can add that value to the team, but there's also other professionals that can add that that value as well, which is look continuing the the, the discussion of, of having everybody contribute um, in, in the discussions and looking at it, the project as a whole, rather than just from your your uh, individual perspective, whether it be architectural, mechanical, electrical, uh, et cetera. One of the things I'd like to add is this idea of broadening the use of energy modeling. Uh, we just did a boot camp for Sustainable Buildings Canada, and one of the energy modelers used the word sandbox tool. 
using an energy model as a sandbox tool really is the beauty of it. Sure, now we have to use energy modeling to meet some certain requirements, but it's so such a valuable tool and it can provide so much more if you use that as the grounding factor for integrated design where you test and you see and you really do get a feel for all the, the variables and how they fit together, that's when you're really, really getting the most out of it. Yeah, for everybody out there, think of energy modeling as an evolution of base principle calculations um, or first principle calculations. So rather than looking at any different measure or retrofit that you were considering uh, in your project, and then having either an internal team or an external team perform first principle calculations to determine what the benefits are for that measure. Um, think of energy modeling as an evolution of that because it's founded on first principles, but then it's also factoring in all of the secondary effects because you're modeling the building as a whole, as opposed to just looking at the lighting system or just looking at the mechanical system because we, we, we underestimate the actual materiality of the secondary effects that one system has on the other. And a lot of the times, here's here's case in point. You'll run some you'll run some first principle calculations on your mechanical system. Let's say you're 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 converting from a packet a PTAC system, package terminal AC, uh, and you you want to go to a really advanced split um, heat pump or uh, or or variable uh, VRF variable flow system. So that's something that we're starting to see a lot of a lot of discussions on, uh, given the flexibility of these systems. When you, if you were to if you were to run that analysis um, using the baseline as your existing building, let's say it's from the 50s to the 70s, where the envelopes uh, design might not have been the greatest compared to today's standards, um, the, you, you're going to compare the operation of your existing mechanical system with uh, compared to the to the new system uh, under the existing envelope loading conditions. The energy performance improvement of the new system is going to look amazing, right? Now, that's scenario A. We're just going to do the mechanical. All of a sudden, you say, well, hey, if we're going to do a retrofit and we're going to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into this aspect of our building, we have some more room in the budget. Why don't we improve the envelope as well? If When you improve the envelope, you've now reduced the load. We mentioned that a little earlier. Uh, so the performance of the building as a whole is, is less demand on the actual mechanical system. And, and then... By, by nature of the secondary effects between the two, the envelope and the mechanical system, the, the in performance improvement of the mechanical system in scenario B with the envelope measure and the new mechanical system is actually less than what it would have been if you just replaced the mechanical system. So again, looking at it um, in a, in, under a magnifying glass, one measure at a time in a traditional retrofit uh, approach uh, can sometimes exaggerate and even inflate expected energy performance results versus taking the holistic approach and seeing that okay yes if if we if we replace the mechanical system it's going to do really well but if if we improve other systems in addition to that the net gain is still very good and it's going to be even better than this, the mechanical system by itself but the 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 incremental performance of just the mechanical system is actually going to look less than if it was by itself um, so I, hopefully that explanation is clear, but essentially is that as you start looking at it from a whole, um, measures that by themselves look really, really good um, can sometimes look not as good when you compare it, um, And but that's, that's in a direct consequence of not factoring in uh, secondary effects. Thank you for that. Uh... Detailed answer, Ryan. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for your time. Uh, Bettina, Dave, and Ryan, thank you so much. Um, our, our, our official time for this webinar was to end at 2 p.m., but um, Sustainable Buildings Canada has uh, recently commissioned a study uh, by Energy at Work, uh, specifically on this topic on uh, condominiums. So I'd like to invite uh, Scott Rouse from Energy at Work to join the panel now. Um, and discuss uh, the research that was done by his team. Uh, so Scott, if you can join us, um, I've just opened up your mic there. I made you a panelist. 
and here and there also uh, Edward um, I'm going to make you a panelist as well Edward Newton who did much of the research um, if you could join us either on mic or camera or both um, and then I will share this uh, yeah I'll, st I'll share this screen um, when they are going to be doing the presentation uh, we have some slides up for them so uh, while we set that up thank you Oh, okay, there's there's Scott. Actually, this is Edward, so you can hear oh, me. Oh, sorry, Edward. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, no problem. So um, I had the uh, the screen sharing. So uh, Edward, if you just tell me when to advance the slides, I'll uh, advance along, and you can describe some of this research. Um, and then, if there are any questions after that, um, we'll be happy to take them. Sure, sure. I think so. Scott should be on right now. I'm, I'm assuming he's probably trying to trying to join. Um, yes, he he was on. So we'll see if I can send him a, a mic request. So um, for our attendees, perhaps um, Edward. Well, we work on that. You could give a, a brief overview. If you want, I can advance this slide a little here. Sure, yeah, thank you. So this uh, this framework is targeting a 50% energy reduction in the condominium sector. Um, and so Energy at Work, so we're an energy management company uh, established in 2013. And really the focus of Energy at Work as an energy consulting company is the EMAP. Um, so this has been in operation for decades at this point, and the essential function of the EMAP is to meet with clients on a regular basis, typically on a monthly basis, uh, to help them achieve their sustainability or their energy uh, reduction goals. And it looks like Scott has just joined us. Oh, we can't hear you, Scott. Um, you might have to open up the mic on your side. So, it, <laughs> yeah, there it says I have your mic open now. Okay. There we go. Now we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, sorry, uh, Edward, uh, you're doing a great job there. So um, I, I'll be very brief. I think we have about five minutes. So I'm, I'm going to go through these slides very quickly. Um, but I would like to uh, just say I enjoyed the webinar and I deeply believe in the deep retrofit and the approach that Enbridge has uh, taken uh, using this. And that's one of the uh, motivations and uh, conclusions from the work that we did. So um, uh, just a short note on Energy at Work. We're an independent energy management company. We focus on uh, uh, helping organizations hit their uh, sustainability objectives. Uh, most recently, we've had a lot of success in the commercial environment, and we wanted to take that experience and apply it to the multi-res. If I can have the next slide, Adam. So uh, what we did is we shared this information with Sustainability in Canada, and um, the experience that we had was uh, really three things. The first one was submitting over 200 condominiums into the Ontario Energy and Water Reporting and Benchmarking Database. But I think what made it a little bit different uh, is that we actually talked to all the 200 condominiums. So it wasn't a matter of just entering the data. We actually talked to the condo uh, property managers and we wanted to get more information about their condominium, uh, shared services. Um, we wanted to know how many bedrooms, uh, how many suites. Um, and we found out um, how challenging it is for a lot of the property managers to submit their data because um, it's not readily at their fingertips. So there was a lot of learning uh, that we were able to achieve. And thanks to Edward, he did a lot of the uh, analytics that we were able to actually look at uh, how different things worked. The second part was uh, the experience we've had in the energy sector um, and particularly the commercial sector where we looked at um, you know, our past three decades of experience and using our what we call our energy management action plan. And then finally, there was the peer review. 
and which we shared all this information to industry experts in the multi-res sector and asked them what they thought of uh, what our approach was and whether it made sense or not. And our whole objective here was to unite all this experience and help condominiums have a pathway to achieve the 50% reduction. Um, this is just the uh, front page of the, um, the report and it's available online, your free download from SBC. So I wanted to thank SBC for this opportunity. Uh, next slide, please, Adam. So what we learned, uh, it, again, from the commercial sector, uh, it was very much important to unite what we call the uh, three Ps, the people, uh, and particularly in the condo sector, this is so important because each condo is controlled by a condo board. And in order to uh, achieve any sort of uh, uh, a change, even a modest one, requires that you, you have a, the ability to actually engage the people involved to make the, the decisions you need. Uh, obviously, they need a process, a playbook, if you like, on how to pull, pull all these pieces together. And then finally, other products. And there's a whole range of energy products that are available um, that can help uh, bring this together. Um, but again, it was the, the EMAP in our case was a process we used and it was to, um, it can be used to customize for others. Next slide, please, Adam. So this was the result of the um, uh, 200 condos that were entered into the um, database. And uh, again, we spoke to uh, over 150. Um, and what we found is that the uh, energy use differed greatly. Um, and you can see the range 10 to 50 equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot per year. Uh, but we felt that this was not the best metric to use. So even though the EWRB is looking at square footage, for the condo, we found that suites are probably a better, uh, we've got a higher R squared uh, using suites than we did for square foot. So it's, um, but we're still learning. And we uh, noticed that the variances that we're seeing um, really you have to dig a lot deeper. Um, we also uh, made the discovery that uh, utility performance is generally not um, monitored by the condo boards. Like uh, having any KPIs with respect to water, gas, or electricity um, really isn't front on their agenda. Um, with the higher costs, it's certainly moving forward. Um, another interesting discovery was age had a very low impact on the, um, on the energy performance. Edward did a number of um, tests on the, very, on the data and uh, found that uh, age was not a good indicator. So again, we learned a great deal. Uh, next slide, please, Adam. So um, with the peer review, um, we held up all of our evidence and we basically uh, shared what we, what we discovered. And we had the experts come back to us and, and really straighten us out on what we assumed would be uh, a good course. They would correct us and say, uh, no, if you're looking at this, you should be looking at the reserve fund, for example. That is a, uh, an important part of a condo world. Um, there was several other um, in, insights they gave us. I think the biggest one came back to the people. If we're going to be successful, we have to put a convincing um, discussion, but not so technical that we alienated the team. So we really did need to uh, bring this down to um, the people that were on the condo board so they could understand and make their respective decisions. Um, we did feel that there is the potential for what we call the perfect storm, and this would be ideal for the deep retrofit. In fact, SBC um, did a project in Ottawa that demonstrated a 50% reduction. But again, they had to have all the pieces coming together, and these would include high utility costs, um, older equipment, uh, tenant comfort issues was a big driver, um, and that was actually the champion of that particular project. So all these things have to come together. Uh, for a lot of the other, I would say the other 90, 98% of the condoms, um, they have to get prepared. And I think there's a lot of work that they have to do even to catch up to the commercial sector. Um, you know, getting their, their uh, basic uh, benchmarking in place, um, understanding the information they're getting. Um, we're starting to see that move forward, but it still has a long way to go. 
Um, but if they get build that foundation, then I think they'll be in the position to achieve the 50% reduction down the road. So again, summing up, it was uh, people are definitely the key in the multi-res world. And uh, again, I'm stressing this is in the condo market. Um, we would come up with different conclusions for the rental market. Um, each sector is very distinct. Uh, the products would be different, um, but I think the process can be adapted to uh, affect it. Um, but again, it's uh, as, as the panel has earlier talked about, it's how how important people are and that wellness, the comfort, et cetera. Next slide. So uh, the paper is available as a white paper off the SBC website. Um, I know I went through this very quickly and probably not the level of detail that you would like to uh, see, but um, uh, certainly we're available if you have any questions. And if you have any questions right now, I'll be happy to take it. Adam? Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, thank you for that, uh, that explanation. Um, so as Scott said, the, uh, the research paper is available on the website, uh, sbcanada.org. And um, we will include a link in the follow-up email to everyone who attended today's workshop. So now we have an opportunity if anyone has any questions uh, for, for any of our experts, including Scott and Edward, um, right now, and um, in the absence of that, we'll, we'll give a, a minute, and then um, we'll we'll wrap up the the webinar with our our great thanks to Enbridge uh, for organizing it and, um, and sponsoring it. Um, so let's see if we have any any further questions. So. There's, there's one other question. There's a couple of very specific questions, um, which, so one of them is, does the deep energy retrofit strategy also cover solar hot water? Um, and well, I, I would say that the, the deep energy retrofit strategy is to take into account every possible measure you can think of um, to reduce energy uh, in your building. But uh, maybe we can pass that around to everyone uh, for your take on that. Totally agree. Yeah, again, don't think of deep energy retrofit as being one measure. Uh, so, as as Adam said, it's deep energy measure. Deep energy retrofits are a a collection or a combination of measures. So, solar water heating might be one. Uh, installing solar panels on the roof uh, to for renewable energy generation that might be another. Connection to a district energy system might be not. So again, it's like. Don't uh, don't pigeonhole yourself into one measure. Like, does this qualify? It's 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 more about establishing a target and uh, establishing a baseline, and then coming up with the measures to to move you from your baseline to achieve your target. And we're saying target approximate that around a 50% reduction from your baseline. So that's that's a starting point. Um, as part of that CMHC uh, program for deep energy retrofits, I know there were several uh, renewable uh, components that were added to several of, of those white papers that they produced, including um, uh, solar electric and solar hot water. And there were some quite interesting uh, takeaways that came out of that. Now, that was several years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if anything has been done uh, more recently, but those papers, I think, still carry some weight today. Scott, I just wanted to thank you for that presentation. I hadn't heard of the research yet, and it's absolutely compelling and fascinating. And I think one of the things that we do see when it comes to what consumers look for when they think about energy, you're right, it's about the simplicity or about getting something that resonates with them. And solar is one of those things that everybody, it's top of mind. You think, oh, uh, a sustainable retrofit or some kind of a green something, put solar onto it. And we know that there's the, that the building envelope itself is the most important, but that doesn't mean that if solar happens to resonate with the people who are in the building, if that is something that is that helps to make the case more compelling, throw it in there as well, not just from an energy, but from a people point of view. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think your um, conversation around the wellness, I think is very important, particularly with that earlier question about COVID. I think people are looking for uh, uh, more assurance on where they are. So um, it was kind of interesting. There was a, a recent uh, Palace Pier uh, just won an award. 
And um, as part of uh, when, when you dug a little bit deeper, I think carbon reduction, green energy efficiency, these are uh, all things that I think resonate with people. So uh, I think uh, too often we forget that it's not just the technical or the economic, it's that social. And I think that's what I like about these, um, but, you know, when you do these workshops, you bring everything together. And I think the big part of that is, you know, the, um, the, the participants sharing what they're expecting out of the building. So it's an excellent program. Well, that's a perfect place to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Scott. Um, so it, with, with great pleasure, I, I would like to thank you all again. Um, so Scott Rez from Energy at Work, Bettina Hoare from Sage Living Toronto, Dave Peterson from Outside In Design Build, and Ryan Evans of Edna Engineering. Um, thank you for this and all of your participation in uh, the Savings by Design program. Um, if any of our attendees have any further questions, uh, you can reach out to me or we'll share some contact information uh, following the webinar. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Take care. Bye for now.